Welcome back to Benjamin West and his cat, the Malkin, by Marguerite Henry. Chapter 7, Little Quickle Friends. How still it was. Benjamin stopped a moment to listen to the stillness. And then he found it was not still at all. A hazelnut dropped with a thud at his feet. Bird wings whistled through the forest. And in the distance, there was the crackling sound of fire. Benjamin sniffed the wind and followed his nose in great excitement. The Indians! They must be firing the forest to kill off the brush, he cried. Make haste, Grimalkin! Grimalkin had stopped to sharpen his claws on a tree. He finished the job to his full satisfaction, then bounded after Benjamin. Little banners of smoke now came winding around the tree trunks like ribbons on a maypole. Benjamin broke into a run. I hope it is old Sassoon, he panted as he ran. If it is, he will bake fish for thee, Grimalkin, and corn cakes for me. Suddenly, Benjamin burst full upon the Indians. The splendor of the sight held him motionless. A great circle of fire was licking at the base of a white fir tree. And around the tree danced Chief Sassoonin and his three sons, Bear and Elk and Beaver. Each waved long poles with moistened rags tied at the ends. Then, as soon as the fire leaped above a certain line on the tree trunk, they snuffed it out with the wet rags. There was a loud hissing sound as the water quenched the fire. Wow, I know what they're doing, exclaimed Benjamin. They are going to fell the tree and hollow out a bark boat. The Indians had not heard. They were too close to the crackling of the fire and the hissing of the water. With quick inspiration, Benjamin squatted down on the earth and began sketching the scene on his poplar board. As the Indian figures took shape, he frowned. I long to paint them a good copper brown, he said to Grimalkin, who lay curled in the crotch of a tree just above Benjamin's head. It seems as if I'm never content. Just then, the Indians came running towards Benjamin, their voices raised in a shrill cry, and... To the crashing and snapping of boughs, the fir tree toppled to the earth. Grimalkin, trembling in fear, leaped onto Benjamin's shoulder. Be not afraid, Kitling, comforted Benjamin. All will soon be quiet. At that precise moment, Sassoonin spied the white boy and the black cat. His old face wrinkled with pleasure. He raised his hand in a salute. Ita, he said in a voice that seemed to come from the bottom of a well. Ita, my little quackle friends. And good be to thee too, laughed Benjamin, jumping to his feet. Then, solemnly, the old Indian chief and the Quaker lad shook hands. Grimalkin sniffed the chief with approval. He liked the smell of bear's grease, which clung to him. Meanwhile, bear and elk and beaver had gathered about the drawing board. Their beady eyes never changed expression. For a long time, they stared at the picture. Finally, Sassoonin joined them and took the board in his hands. He pointed to the tree that Benjamin had drawn. It is good, he said. Why, he says good, exclaimed Benjamin. Did thee hear that, Grimalkin? Sassoonin says the tree is good. Amen, nodded bear and elk and beaver. Again, Sassoonin picked up the board. This time he pointed to the Indians dancing around the fire. With a look of displeasure, he clenched his right hand and threw out his opened hand as if he were tossing away something very unpleasant. His sons shouted and said, Amen. Be 
Benjamin was puzzled. Had he hurt Sassoonin's feelings? For answer, Sassoonin rose, his old knees cracking like the fire. With his forefinger, he motioned Benjamin to pick up his drawing board and follow. Then he reached into a shelter of brush and drew out a deerskin bag filled with bear's grease. In a single file, Benjamin, with Grimalkin on his shoulder and the three young Indians, followed Sassoonin. Silently, they wound through the forest gloom. Benjamin was not in the least afraid. Sassoonin was an old friend. Each year he came to door latch in with things to sell. Baskets and brooms, venison meat and wild turkey, deer skin, bear skin, beaver and raccoon. Many times Sassoonin's clan had raised their wigwams in Papa's orchard <coughs> and hobbed their, hobbled their horses in the upland meadows. And once, Sassoonin had stayed a whole week at the inn while Papa and Mama went to the year meeting in Philadelphia. <coughs> now they were coming out on grassy land close to the stream that skirted the inn. A bridge made of a single tree trunk lay across the stream. Sassoonin stooped low. He pointed to the bridge and then to his back. It was plain to see that he wanted to carry Benjamin pickaback as he used to do when Benjamin was very small. Benjamin blushed. He was much too big to ride pickaback now, but Sassoonin was chief of the turtle clan. It was a great honor to be carried by a chief. Besides, he could not offend Sassoonin. So, with Grimalkin still on his shoulder, he climbed onto Sassoonin's back trying to make himself as light as possible. Benjamin watched the old chief's feet. They curved around the tree trunk as securely as the claws of a woodpecker. He could hardly wait to try it himself. When they reached the opposite bank, things happened so fast that Benjamin's eyes were everywhere at once. At a word from Sassoonin, Bear began scooping up handfuls of red earth. Beaver began scooping up handfuls of yellow clay. Then, with a small stone for a muller and a large flat stone for a grinding slab, Bear and Beaver began to grind the lumps of earth. Elk, meanwhile, was gathering mussel shells. Beaver finished first. His red earth was powdered very fine. Sassoonin now took a mussel shell from elk and poured some of the powdered earth into it. Then he mixed it with bear's grease and stirred and stirred until it formed a reddish brown paste. At last, with a look of triumph, he handed the mixture to Benjamin and pointed to the drawing board. Benjamin dipped his finger into the color. It trembled a little as he painted the Indian figures a rich coppery red. Grimalkin, he shouted, at last I have color, color, color. Grimalkin acted as if he understood. He leaped several times into the air and mewed his approval. Amen, 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 the Indians cried. Suddenly they began stripping pieces of birch bark from a stand of trees near the water. Then they squatted on their heels and began to paint on the bark with the red and yellow colors they had made. Benjamin watched open-mouthed. The Indians were working with fine skill. Sassoonin was painting a turtle because he was chief of the turtle clan. The youngest Indian was painting a beaver because his name meant beaver. The second Indian was painting a bear and the third an elk. What fascinated Benjamin was the way they laid on their colors. Beaver had chewed the stem of a tall spear of grass and was using the chewed end exactly as if it were a goose quill pen. Sassoonin was using a flat piece of wood that looked like a miniature butter paddle and elk was using a peach piece of birch bark. Think on it, Benjamin whispered to Grimalkin. The Indians like to draw too. 
At last, I found some real school fellows. And right there in the heart of Penn's forest, Benjamin West joined his first art class. The sun was directly overhead when the Indians went back to finish their boat. While Grimalkin sunned himself in a small patch of sunlight, Benjamin helped the Indians gather dry twigs to lay on top of the felled trunk. He helped set fire to them. He even helped swab the sides of the trunk. After the fire had scooped a deep hollow in the trunk, bear and elk and beaver scraped the inside surfaces with pieces of flint. Benjamin watched them a long time to see just how it was done. Then he gathered oak leaves until his stick was full. Little quackle friends soon eat, announced Sassoonin, when the inside of the canoe was scraped as smooth as a stone. While corn cakes roasted in the charred tree stump, bear and elk and beaver invited Benjamin to go fishing. With nothing but bird's claws for fish hooks, they caught eight sunfish and a red-bellied trout. Grimalkin had good luck, too. He caught a frog. Afternoon found Benjamin and the Indians sitting on the floor of the forest, sharing their food. How Sassoonin and his sons enjoyed the sliced ham and the fresh bread and ciderkin. They even ate Grimalkin's bonny clabber. As for Benjamin and Grimalkin, they preferred the corn cakes and the fish. They ate until they could hold no more. Sassoonin grunted contentedly when the meal was over. He took a clay pipe out of the skin pouch that hung around his neck. He filled it with tobacco and puffed slowly. After a long silence, he spoke softly to his sons. At once they brought out their bows and arrows and taught Benjamin how to shoot flying squirrels on the wing. Then they showed him how to make a sun sign. They drew a circle on the ground with a sharp stone and drove a twig into the center of the circle, bending it in the direction of the sun. I see, nodded Benjamin, if we should be scouts, we could make a sun sign for our followers. It would tell them when we left here. Amen, replied the Indians, pleased at the quickness of their pupil. Suddenly, Benjamin realized that the twig pointed to sunset time. He picked up his stick of leaves and his poplar board and whistled for Grimalkin. Run, run! spoke Sassoonin. Cold night, soon here. Goodbye, little quackle friends. 